So in the meantime, I will I will introduce Eliska Reprovla. She's an assistant professor at Kabli Institute of Nanoscience at Delft University of Technology. And he's also a member of World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Quantum Applications. And uh, she works on the boundary of quantum computation, artificial intelligence, and condensed matter. And she will present this uh, quantum big data where condensed matter meets quantum computing. So also looking forward for your talk, Elishka. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alba. Thanks for having me. I am I'm really happy to be here. Uh, yeah, thank you for the for the kind introduction. I also for the seminar wanted to give kind of a bigger perspective on how the interplay of a different fields in physics can contribute to to proper manipulation and learning from quantum big data. I will explain in a bit what I mean by that concept. So, as Alba was already saying. Uh, my group works at the boundary of uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and condensed matter. And I am particularly interested in this kind of emergent problems that occur when these two fields meet, because they actually do have a much in common. And I'm interested to see how we can borrow things from each other and move the outstanding problems in this different field for the different fields uh, forward together. So maybe let me now address the, the thing that is that was the main thing in the title of my talk, and that was this concept of quantum big data. I think that to this audience, this is not going to be a particularly strange or a surprising concept, but I find myself uh, explaining this because so when we start using artificial intelligence in physics, the sort of very natural question occurs, which is uh, how AI algorithms became useful across other fields is, uh, is via availability of increasing amounts of data. And this is true about everything from medical databases to pictures on the internet. And physics, on the other hand, tends to be about this like deep intuitive understanding and toy model building. So maybe the idea of a big data there is a, is a slightly counterintuitive, but again, all of you already know that it isn't, but just so we agree on the same language. The central object that we all working with on a daily basis actually is a source of a huge amount of data because it doesn't scale particularly favorably with the size of your system, right? If I will have a two spins or two qubits, I need four numbers to record them. If I have 10, I need a thousand. And if I have a thousand, I need 10 to the, 10 to the 300. Sometimes people make this comparison that the age of the universe in seconds is 10 to the 22. For me, it's not, like usually helpful to think about the size of the vector like that, but but it tells you it tells you that it's a, that it's a very big number, right? And and this is the reason why on one hand we need quantum computers to handle very difficult problems, and why on the other hand many many problems are not attainable and solvable for us with uh, this standard exact uh, sort of digital way of thinking. Um, oh. Now my, now my slides got stuck. Okay, now it works, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, and then there is a second thing, right? That I, as a theorist, I can complain all day long about how my exact problem solutions scale unfavorably and I cannot really write those wave functions and understand them. But then there is the other direction and that's the experimental measurement. Because when I start sampling from wave functions that lives, live in this complex Hilbert space experimentally, what you quickly find out is that you actually need a lot of, lot of real measure measurement data that are actually experimentally accessible. 
So this is just to say that we actually have a lot of sources of big data in quantum physics, two prominent ones that I see are the wave function themselves as an extremely data intensive objects. And the second one is that even not so large scale quantum experiments leads to lead to large amount of data that we need to that we need to process and understand. So now in physics, we need to we need to sort of reconcile these two these two different approaches, the, the simple toy model ones and the data driven ones. And now we are living in this fantastic time where the condensed matter and quantum technology and in general quantum chemistry have become accessible to exactly experimentally work at the boundary where it becomes difficult to simulate classically, but at the same time, it can be a great source of, of novel understanding from, from uh, these experiments. So I wanted to address the, the boundary of like AI, quantum computing and condensed matter on one very specific example and try to take these three really different perspectives on it. And I have only short time to talk today, so I will go over three different projects in a very bigger picture language, but I hope that it will, it will still be informative. The, the example I picked are quantum error correcting codes. Again, I know that a lot of you are already experts in quantum computing, so I'm now going to do a brute force jump to not explain to you how qubits flips and why we need to correct them, but like I am going to go straight up to uh, quantum error correcting toric code, which is this, uh, which is this cool toy model that uh, that uh, people have developed to correct sources of errors in quantum devices, but it's also super cool in itself as a condensed matter model. So the, the reason why you need sort of more complex things than just the majority votes on your errors, you, you know, because you have, a, you have a lot of noise and superposition and really like a really complex phenomena arise in quantum circuits. And then this model that Alexei Kitaev proposed, it really just has these two terms. The first uh, is the sum over the stars, the crosses. I think I didn't activate it, my pointer, but I think you can see the cross that is the product of sigma axis in the figure on the right. And then there is a second term, which is the plaquette product of four sigma z, which is the, which is the square in the lattice. This model is super cool because it's actually exactly analytically solvable. You can just find the ground state. And the degenerate ground state of this model happens to encode two qubits. Roughly speaking, how it works is that if you want to move from one of this fourfold degenerate ground state to another, you would have to flip all the qubits along the red line or all the qubits along the blue line. So that gives you two options. And then if you wrap it up on the torus with the periodic boundary condition, it looks like it looks like this. So so that's why that's why it's called the toric code. So let me start by giving perspective on this quantum error correction that is kind of let's now leave an AI out of it for a second. And just think about how, how condensed matter physicists and uh, quantum computing experts approach this model a little bit differently. Now I am going to say something that is conceptually important for the, for the later. So, so this slide is important. You can arrive to this glorified fourfold degenerate ground states that protects your qubits because you would have to flip everything along the line by two conceptually different ways. Either digital one, so to speak, where you just make a quantum circuit and you just apply a projective operators until you project onto the state that you want to be in. So this is also something that has been, exp um, that has been implemented experimentally uh, both at ETH and, and by Google. And then there is a second thing where there is also an interesting Google experiment on the right hand side of my slide, where you can just say, just look, I don't want to play this measurement guacamole and just keep trying to project, project, project until I get to the state I want. I can just engineer the Hamiltonian interaction 
you saw that I have a four body interaction in the Hamiltonian, so it's non-trivial but doable. And if I am engineering that Hamiltonian, just by energy requirements, the system will eventually sit into the ground state that I, that I want to be in because there's the cheapest state from the energy point of view. So just to elaborate on these two point of view, I have here a slide that I took from the uh, that I took from the from the ETH paper on an error correction. You can probably explain to me better than I can to you what all of these gates are doing. But really, how it works is that you begin from an arbitrary state that you can easily prepare. That's all the zeros here. Then you measure the projectors on your stabilizer operators with the high frequency. But sometimes the measurement is uh, random, right? You sometimes end up in the eigenstate that corresponds to the excited state, not to the ground state. So that's why people implement the so-called decoders that take the result of your experimental measurements, you bring it back to the circuit and flip the qubit that messed it up for you. And eventually you will arrive to the ground state. The sort of second thing to look at it is, as I was saying, is to just physically engineer the Hamiltonian interaction. And then you will be, then the system will eventually sit down into the ground state of whatever you engineer. Then you can just measure your state a little bit, do something called Hamiltonian learning, where you figured out what's the Hamiltonian that you engineered. And then you just use the results of your Hamiltonian learning of your measurements to correct tuning parameters of your Hamiltonian and you will repeat this until you will repeat this until you arrive uh, to the ground state. Uh, there is a there is a fun there is a fun thing if you think about imprecision on this is actually like I think only like really technical comments. So if you don't understand it super much, we can come back to it uh, in, the, in the question time. Uh, if you think about the perturbations that can arise uh, during your, inter during your uh, engineering of this Hamiltonian for air correction, uh, you can actually write them up in a way that does not violate your exact solvability, which are these blue and red terms here. You sort of introduce the perturbation plug advice in this like exponential. But the, the, the beautiful thing is that then the system stays exactly solvable. So we could sample from it and prepare ground states of whatever, whatever size we wanted. And then in our case, we use the neural network, but what method do you use that doesn't really matter. We just figured out the mapping that connect, connects from the measurements on those states to the, to the uh, parameters on your Hamilton, of your Hamiltonian. And then the beautiful thing was that when we applied it to the states that we now you see my lattice here is very small when we applied it to the states that came from the perturbed hamiltonians that were not exactly solvable by a few rounds of iterative protocol i take a measurements on the hamiltonian the colors red and blue here it just shows you a amplitude of the perturbations in z and x basis then I tell my neural network, find the Hamiltonian. It finds the Hamiltonian. I tune the, tune the, um, the interaction parameters. I adjust the Hamiltonian. So you see that after one repetition, it doesn't go perfectly. So I repeat again and I repeat again. And eventually you arrive like this to an almost perfect toricode ground state. And when I say almost perfect on ground state, I really mean probability of single qubit error being in 10 to the minus four, which is uh, way below any kind of uh, error correcting threshold. So this was, this was just to say that actually, maybe it's really funny and interesting to look at the quantum circuit digital implementation of things as a problem in a Hamiltonian engineering. And with all of this data learning approaches we can available, we have available nowadays, we can learn and adjust those Hamiltonians very, very easily. Then I think that the first questions you first question you are going to ask me after this is like, but how do you know that your perturbation that you train it on actually generalizes well to the rest of the all the possible horrible things that could happen during the experiment? 
So then in the next, in the second part, I am going to leave the digital out of it and look at if we can use neural networks to approximate all the phase diagram of this Tory code model from the condensed matter point of view. So you may have already heard about idea of using neural networks as a variational ansatzes for your quantum states. Similarly, how you, how you use, uh, how you use uh, for example, parametrized quantum circuits or matrix product states, you can also just take a neural network and you use the parameters in the neural network as a variational, as a optimizable parameters in your variational ansatz. Here is just a few examples from restricted Boltzmann machines that kind of started this whole idea back in 2017 to more, to more elaborate, uh, elaborate ansatzes that people are using nowadays. Basically, this is this is just the repetition of what I just said. This is this idea of the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a neural network that just has two layers, visible and hidden. And the parameters that you have here, the A's, W's, and B's, basically the weights and biases that specify, that characterize all your neurons and the connections in the neural networks, can be just used as a variational parameters. And then what you want to do is to optimize the parameters in the network on the left to find the ground state in the Hilbert space that you are that you are looking for on the right. But then, of course, the question is, which are the states that I can efficiently approximate with a only small amount by small, I mean, polynomial scaling weights and biases in this neural network without ending up with the exponential number of coefficients again. So one thing that you can straightforwardly do is that just keep increasing the number of neurons. And then the blob of the states that you can approximate efficiently in your Hilbert space will keep growing like this. But then it turns out that this story code is an example of a pesky problem where actually it's very, very hard with this kind of method. And for that matter, other methods like uh, Quantum Monte Carlo or, uh, or Tensor Networks, to actually capture those different states that could arise by perturbing your Hamiltonian weirdly during your experimental implementation. So the super cool, simple, but genius idea that Agnes Valenti had when we started working on it was to inject a little bit of a, of a physical intuition into this restricted Boltzmann machine concept. And that's the following. So the, the yellow boxes are the, are the visible neurons that we have already had. But now we just add extra visible neurons that represent the correlators. And you know that in physics, correlators are very important. And for some specific reason, I was talking about this four body interaction in the toric code a lot. And what happens if you add a visible neurons that are just products of two body and four body interactions of your, in your visible layer, like you just calculate the product of those values of those other neurons. Then maybe you can actually capture, now I, now I did here even, now I made here even bigger blob that actually captures the ground states. You can maybe actually capture a really diverse ground states that would be really hard to approximate otherwise. So just to give a concrete comparison, this is just one cut through the really difficult, difficult uh, three-dimensional phase diagram of the story code model. And you see that the black line is your exit ground state and the blue line is energy per spin that comes from the RBMs. And on the right hand side of the slide, you see that if I keep increasing hidden neurons, it doesn't exactly help. And now see what happens if I, instead of increasing hidden neurons, I just add these correlators. We suddenly got a many, many orders of magnitude of variational precision of variational precision in approximating these ground state. So this was just to kind of say that actually neural networks are also like super flexible in capturing, in capturing quite diverse and variationally not super accessible 
accessible states in this uh, in this error models. And so the last thing that I wanted to show you to connect the full circle and that's sort of the most quantum informational one and it's super much uh, in, and it's a super much a work in progress still, but I want to still put it out there to kind of close the circuit. And that's the connection of uh, that's the connection of AI and and uh, quantum computing in a in a digital sense. In connection to the previous uh, to the previous thing where I was telling you about that you can just take a neural network and minimize variationally the parameters. What you are optimizing there is energy. But oftentimes you minimize the energy you minimize, but then the state you get, what does it have to physically do with the state that you want to get? That's not always clear. Sometimes it's an open question and sometimes the connection is quite tenuous. So uh, with my PhD student Arash, we wanted to ask ourselves a question if we can characterize the approximated states in some sort of um, quantum information or quantum circuits kind of language. So we would really understand how those states are related, not just that the energy is the same. So here is the example of something called mana. Is the so-called, is the, is the one of these magic monotones. It happens to be super hard to calculate, but basically really what does it tell you is the like, Compute quantum computational complexity of the circuit that you are preparing in terms of non-cliffordness. It's one number that quantifies how many T gates you put in your circuit. You know that it's just not easy to say it's my circuit is five T gates complex because it depends what was the state before, was the state after and where you put the T gate exactly. So, so people are thinking about this so-called magic monotones that measure this complexity in some sort of monotonous quantifiable way. So just an example here. Um, if we start the circuit in zero, zero, we do two Hadamards that does nothing in terms of mana because it's Clifford. Then I do one K gate that it's Clifford, doesn't matter. I do a first T gate, my mana jumps. I do a second gate on a second T gate on my first qubit, mana jumps up, then I do two Hadamards, mana stays the same. That's really just like an intuition, like I have a number that measures the T gateness of my circuit. Now we bring it back to this uh, RBM, the restricted Boltzmann machines. So we, so, okay, this, this becomes complicated because the mana, you cannot calculate it for qubits, you can only calculate it for qtrids, so I'm actually taking here a different Hamiltonian than the Tory code Hamiltonian, but it's a, you see that it also has a X and Z terms, so it's in like a similar, it's in a similar neighborhood, let's say. Fun fact, in the first line, you have uh, in green, energy of the variational neural network and in orange the exact diagonalization and the alpha is just the ratio of hidden and visible units see the first line just tell you what i just said before you keep increasing the number of hidden units and your approximation of the energy of your neural network and your actual states keep coming closer and closer and this we will get like very very precise and if we could want to go even preciser, we could start playing this correlator tricks. So interesting thing, if I calculate the mana, well then, if Arash calculates the mana of the approximated neural network and compares it to the mana of the exact state, you are going to find something that I found completely mind blowing, which is this. The, computational complexity, the mana, the number of T gates you need to prepare the approximated state is higher than the computational complexity of the state you are trying to approximate. So this is just my like final provocative question to finish this, like maybe all of this variational optimization just using variational principle in energy is not the best idea because maybe the approximations we are getting have some complex other properties like quantum computational complexity that has very little to do with the state we are actually approximating. So I know a lot of you are 
experts on quantum circuits, so I will just leave this thought here, right? Maybe we should be thinking about these methods sort of out of the box and thinking about maybe approximating some, some other things. So with that, let me, let me quickly conclude. I wanted to show you some interesting overlays between um, AI condensed matter and, and quantum computing on this like specific example of the error correcting code. The first point I was trying to make was that I think it's really interesting to look more at the overlay and interplay between digital and analog quantum computing because our capacity to engineer different interaction directly and estimate those engineered parameters really precisely keeps racing. And maybe sometime soon, of course, I just showed you a numerical simulation, so the experiment may be different, but I have a feeling these two might start com be competitive with each other very soon. And competitive, I mean, compared to just like a digital discretized quantum circuit. So I think there is an exciting opportunities to a lot of problems to think about there. Then the second thing was that uh, that comes from the AI and feeds into the condensed matter, which is not a new idea. That neural networks are actually really, really good variational ansatzes for a quantum states. And I just showed you one example where we did that and peppered in a little bit of the physical intuition and we managed to get like a really cool approximations for a really hard state. And the last thing was just this very like open questions about quantum computational complexity of this uh, neural networks or neural network quantum states. And maybe with this, with this new, like our ability of seeing quantum states as a neural networks, maybe that gives us tool to also sort of like variationally rethink how do we approach our digital variational quantum algorithms. With that, let me thank to my collaborators, especially PhD students, Agnes and Araj, who were in charge of uh, these projects that I talked about. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Eliska. Very interesting talk as well. Um, let's see if there are questions in the chat. At least we have time for two question, official questions. And then if we are running out of time, we will close the meeting and continue discussions offline, uh, but also connected in this Zoom. OK, I can see uh, one question. on. Uh, thanks for this really nice talk from Ilya Kait. One, on one of your slides, you presented a benchmark of, uh, I think it's convolutional uh, um, restrictive Boltzmann machine and RBMs. Uh, did you look at other methods, other neural network arch architectures, or is RBMs the gold standard? Oh, so I really think that actually really depends on the problem. We have uh, Juan Carasquia, I see here, who is actually an expert on using uh, recurrent neural networks. So in our work, we didn't compare to the recurrent specifically. Like, I think so far, like what we understand, it like depending on the model, it really, it really depends. It, it, it really depends. I've seen uh, models where convolutional convolutional just feed forward neural networks outperforms RBMs super much. But for example, in this story code, we compare to a bunch of standard examples and the sort of correlator spiced up RBM work much better. But then when you use this recurrent neural networks, you, you can sample from them exactly. So that's sort of like a thing that people quote as a as a huge as a huge advantage. So I don't think like somehow this field is so young that I don't think we have like a really clear like this is better than that. This is better than that. One one feeling that I have is that these more advanced, most more advanced uh, methods where you add a little bit more thought into the architecture, for example, by introducing the convolutional filters or thinking about this uh, recurrent stuff, they tend to perform better on average than the, than the vanilla RPMs in most cases. OK, I can see another quick question uh, before in the chat. I think uh, Sri uh, Dajargo. 
I think uh, they say ever do life experiment. I think they refer to the first uh, slides where you presented the results and mentioned that uh, there were some experiments that in, in implemented them. So could you clarify that? Is there an, is there an experiment or all of, the, of these results are simulations? Ah, so so the so the results I talked about talked about today like from from our side they are they are all simulations well yeah they are all like our results are all are all theoretical but at the same time I really want to highlight that on this Google 50 qubit chips they implemented both digital and analog engineering of this of the story code already so I think that's that's very exciting and maybe just to like just to like uh, advertise my group a little bit. I was talking about this uh, quantum simulation stuff a lot today because I thought it was fit in this colloquium, but we are actually doing a lot on using AI to, to control real life quantum experiments uh, here, uh, here at the uh, QTAC at TU Delft. So if that's some interest, if that sounds interesting, definitely do check our website. Maybe you can talk about this uh, a little bit later because now we have to close this meeting. I see more questions in the chat. I think we can continue discussing them a, a little bit longer. So let me close this uh, curiosity seminar here. And thank you everyone for coming and thanks for, for the speakers, especially very two interesting uh, talks and also a slightly different as we're used to uh, in curiosity because we taught other things, not only quantum computing. And thank you very much and see you next curiosity. <laughs>